Good afternoon. Can you hear me, guys? Yes. Perfect. So, welcome to Fluid Mechanics 2. I am Alessandro De Rosis, and I want to make clear immediately one thing. I am here to achieve one main goal, that you pass this exam in a very brilliant way. In order to do it, I strongly encourage you to come to the lectures. Here is where you can pose all the questions. Here is where you can get the vast majority of the most important information. At the exam, there will not be any surprise. You will be assessed about what we will do together, what you can find in Blackboard, what you will see during the tutorials. Nothing more, nothing less. But I expect you, if tomorrow I will do an exercise with you, I expect you being able to solve that kind of exercise. Today I will give you a brief introduction to the unit. I will also show you the, the structure of the final exam. Like you, will be easier than last year. And we will start, if we have time, with dimensional analysis. We aim to finish 10 minutes before 3 p.m. Yeah, 2.50. So today I also want to give you, to let you understand what's my approach to teaching. Fluid mechanics, you underwent fluid mechanics one with a lot of very nice relatively boring equations. You can imagine that in fluid mechanics too we have more equations which can be very, very boring. To me, it's not important that you are able to write exactly all the terms of the equations, but it's important that you understand what there is behind the single terms of the equations and you know how, where you can apply this. For example, Today I can come and say, hey, guys, let's discuss about the Raleigh-Taylor instability, a very nice fluid mechanics phenomenon. And I can go there and write all these equations, and you will leave this room approximately after one minute. But instead of doing this, I would prefer to let you know that the Raleigh-Taylor instability, just as an example, is the mixing between two fluids is something that, is, that happens every day, for example, in the Crab Nebula. And this is something that happens also when you pour milk into your coffee. And it's also something that you can have on your laptop right now by doing some very simple numerical simulations. Fluid mechanics plays um, an impressive role in engineering. Here you have some examples of possible applications. Airbag inflation, flow around a motorbike, the flow uh, in, uh, in the heart, or the inflation of a parachute. You can see that we can span a very large set of possible applications. But fluid mechanics is popular not only in engineering. Let's discuss, for example, about the Magnus effect. The Magnus effect is the rotation that undergoes, is the force and the rotation that undergoes a sphere when you spin it, and it is in air in a certain fluid. As I mentioned before, regarding the Magnus effect, we can write some very nice equations, or we can see the effect of the Magnus force by just having a look at very talented free kickers, Messi, Pirlo, I like Juninho Pernambucano. And here, for example, you can see how David Beckham is able to use the Magnus effect in order to score an amazing goal. Let's give a minute to Beckham to score. Mm 
Now I said, and you can play to be Beckham in your laptop, because there are some software which allows you to effectively simulate a free kick. Here we have a computer simulation of a free kick. You can see the vorticity field and the nice bent trajectory of the ball. Fluid mechanics is ubiquitous in real life. You can have, for example, the sudden rupture of a dam. On the top right, you have a simulation of a swimmer, which moves in a fluid, and due to the motion of the tail, it is able to generate a thrust force and to move leftward. Or you can have sprays, which are a typical example of multi-component, multi-phase flows. You can have got that from Beckham to a swimmer, the range of possible applications of the very same set of equations is impressively large. During this unit, we will go through some topics. The first one is dimensional analysis. Then we will jump into pipe, in the flows in pipes and pumps. Specifically, we will go through the basics of this flow. We will quantify end losses and we will discuss about system composite of several pipes and pumps. Third topic, open channel flows. We will um, underline the differences with respect to pipes flow. And we will discuss about uniform and non-uniform flows. Then I will step back. Dr. Nasser will jump into the lecture and will accompany you through the topic of compressible flows. Very last lecture, question and answer, revision, exam preparation. We will have lectures every Thursday, 2 p.m. here. Please cover the material in Blackboard before coming here. Weeks 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13. There is a, mm, a, a tutorial immediately after this lecture, so we have to finish 10 minutes before in order to give you the possibility to run in the new room. I'm not responsible of the timetable, by the way. And then there are some lab sessions. As I mentioned before, I'm, I will be really happy if you can get 100% of marks. Please follow the lectures, have a look at Blackboard, Use the discussion board, email me at any time, and I'm more than happy to arrange with you face-to-face, -face, Zoom meetings, reply to your emails, whatever. Last year, students complained a bit about the fact that it was not so clear what they expected at the exam. For this reason, during the lectures, I will underline every time there is something which is very significant, very important for the exam. Here is how to get 100% of marks. There are some lab activities which will count towards the 10%. 5% is attendance. 5% is a short MCQ test which will be delivered online. In the next week, I will give you some further instruction about this. Then there is a midterm test around the beginning of November, which will be only about what you will do with me. So it will be about dimensional analysis, pipe and pumps, and open channel flow. It is a kind of teaser, a kind of trailer of what you will have at the exam. The questions you will have at the midterm MCQ test are of the same style, of the same flavor of the question of the exam. It, again, it is an online Blackboard MCQ test. And then there is the final exam in person MCQ test. Last year, students had 45 questions. Let's reduce it to 30, because 45 maybe were too many. 
and the day of the exam, you will find this thing. You are almost 500. Marking 500 script one by one is not the easiest possible thing. You have to fill this document. Please. I noticed there were 100 questions on the bubble sheet. No worries, because this is a predefined uh, bubble sheet, OK? But you have to fill only the first 30. In the remaining one, you can write anything. The software will not read it. Please, when you come the day of the exam, of course, I will repeat this during the last lecture. First thing to do, state very clearly your student ID. These bubble sheets will be read by a software called Gradescope. The software will recognize, will identify you through the student ID. Once you've stated it very clearly, my suggestion is start filling it by using a pencil. And only when you're really, really sure this is the correct reply, fill it with a pen. Could you please log in to menti.com and put the code you see on the top? Please tell me. Could you repeat, please? Yes. Please log in. 4.8, huh? 4.9, 4 4.8, 4 please. That's okay. Now, now I want to know who voted for strongly disagree. Let's be bold. Where are you? <laughs> huh? OK. Let's reply to another question. I can see a significant number of persons who are not convinced. Is, does anyone require further clarification about how to get 100%? OK, so you are kidding. Now let me play a bit. Please log in to this other test.
So guys, please. Where are the 17 compressible persons? The 20 compressible persons, well, it's still rising. Okay, if some one of you was kidding, fair enough. If some, some one of you was serious, during the mid-term MCQ test, you will not be assessed about compressible flows, because you will have it just when my part will finish. Thanks for these 22 very kind persons. And now, let me kid you a bit. Next question. <laughs> Guys, this is a very important question. So it seems that Messi won. I'm disappointed. Okay. But that's life. Before moving further, and we will play with dimensional analysis, please let me stress again that the hour we spend here, which will be 50 minutes, let's try to get the best from this hour, which might be knowing your opinion about Cristiano and Messi, which could be, please be very careful when I will underline some concept, when I will do some exercise with you, because it's likely, when I say likely, I mean extremely likely, that an exercise that I will do in front of you will be something that you will find the day of the exam. Of course, use Blackboard, email me, come to my office, make the sixth floor core four, whenever you want, and I'm happy to, to, to help you. By the way, any native Italian speaker? Uno? Any native Spanish speaker? Que me escribáis en español, por favor. No? Okay. So, guys, the first topic is dimensional analysis. There is some material on Blackboard. Hopefully you are ready, went through it. Today, for me, it's important that we understand what is it. The first thing we need to classify is the difference between dimensions and unit. A dimension is a measure of a physical quantity without any numerical value. A unit is a way to assign a number to that dimension. Length is a dimension. Time is a dimension. 10 seconds is the unit, the corresponding unit. So if tomorrow at the exam someone will ask you, is length a unit or a dimension, you know what you have to reply. These are common, classical, canonical examples of 
dimensions and units which are commonly used in fluid mechanics. Mass, length and time are the most popular. A very important principle is related to dimensional homogeneity. It means that you cannot sum two quantities with different dimensions. You can sum two lengths, you can sum two volumes, you can sum two areas, you can sum two times, but you cannot sum a length and an area, a length and a time, a length and a velocity, and so on. When doing a dimensional analysis, the working principle, the core of the dimensional analysis, is called Buckingham Working Rule. Now we will see how to apply Buckingham Working Rule to solve some practical problems. B Buckingham Rule tells you that you have a certain problem. In this problem, you can identify some variables. You count the variables and you say, I have n variables in my problem. We will specify this in a while. These variables contain a certain number of dimensions. Let me call this number of dimensions m. In order to perform the dimensional analysis of this problem, you need to define some dimensionless group. How many? n minus m. So, you state your variables, and you say, I have, for example, eight variables. You count the number of dimensions, and you say, for example, I have five dimensions. Eight minus five, three. You can say immediately that your problem will be governed by three dimensionless parameters. These dimensionless parameters are also called as pi groups. Each pi group does not depend on the other. There are many ways to create this group. Something which um, people were used to do was by experience. What do I mean? In, this, in Manchester, Reynolds, some centuries ago, did many experiments and he developed he proposed the Reynolds number, and he derived the Reynolds number based on a very large amount of experiments he built through decades. So, by learning some experience, Reynolds arrived to define the Reynolds number. This applies to Reynolds number, fruit number, and many others. But we aim to perform a more rigorous mathematical systematic approach to compute, to identify the existence of pi groups in a certain problem. In order to do it, independently from the fluid problem you will face, you always have to uh, follow this seven steps approach. The first step, you have your problem, you state your variables. Then, to each variable, you will assign its dimensions. Apply backing and working rule means the difference between the number of variables and the number of dimensions. So you know how many pi groups you will have. Then step four, choose repeating variables. And we will make an example in order to understand the last four um, steps. Let's make this example. Okay. Let's imagine that we have a certain wall. Mm. 
this wall has a certain height. I will call it H. There is some wind on this wall. The wind is coming with a certain velocity. I will call this velocity U. You can imagine that the wall will undergo a certain force due to the presence of the wind. I will call this force F. We are in air, we can be in water, we can be in oil, we can be in any kind of fluid. For sure, this fluid will have a certain density, rho, and a certain dynamic viscosity, mu. How many variables I have in my problem? Five. Please. Five variables, but you have three main we have three main dimensions, so you actually end up making two pi groups. But how do you know which is a how do you know which is a repeating variable and which isn't? I will tell you immediately. So the statement is correct. We have five variables. <coughs> Let's state for each variable its corresponding dimension. So, force, mass, length, time power minus two, velocity, length, time power minus one, density, mass, length to the power minus three, height, length, dynamic viscosity, mass, length to the power minus one, time to the power minus one. Three dimensions. Five minus three equal to two. Two pi groups. Step number four, choose repeating variables. How to choose the repeating variables? The key idea is that we have to choose repeating variables to be the simplest possible variables of the problem. What do I mean by simplest possible variables? I mean variables with the possibly less number of uh, with the possible less number of dimensions. Let's be practical. I can say that I, can, I want the force F to be a repeating variable based on what I just told you. Would you choose F to be a repeating variable? No. Why? Because there is H with one dimension, U and Rho with two. F as three is the most disadvantaged. Dynamic viscosity, you have three dimensions. Again, same story. You can ask me, but I want to choose F and Mu as a repeating variable. May I use it? For sure. Absolutely, you can. But the computations will be more difficult. Please. These are the dimensions. Yeah, we have one variable, and then we have the variable rho as with the dimensions m and power minus three. So in that in that situation, which is the simplest variable? Uh, uh, to compare what? Pick the repeating variable. Yeah, you, you exclude. How many variables you have here? Five, right? You exclude those who have the largest number of dimensions. Which are those with the largest number of dimensions? F, F and Mu. So you exclude this, you look at the others, 
and you keep the other. Okay? It, it, it's going by exclusion. You exclude the most complicated ones. Please. So the non-repeating variable is the one with the greatest number of primary dimensions making it up. Yeah. There is also another consideration to be done that I will, and I will talk about it in a while. Please tell me. You have repeating and non-repeating variables, right? The non-repeating variables are equal to the number of pi groups you want to form. So you have five variables in total. You need two pi groups, so you will have two non-repeating variables. You will have three repeating. Repeating, okay? So you identify the simplest variables of your problem, okay? And you say, I will choose u, rho, and h as my repeating variables. Step number five. You will have two groups, pi1 and pi2. Pi 1, you state the first non-repeating variables, in our case, the force. And you multiply this by the following quantity. The first non-repeating variable, rho, to the power a. The second repeating variable, u, to the power b. The third repeating variable, to the power c. Then you go for the second group, pi 2. The other non-repeating variable, mu, multiplied by rho power alpha, u power beta, h power gamma. I am using a, b, c, alpha, beta, and gamma because are different, okay? But in principle, I can call these exponents as I like. Step, so, step number five, you just build the two-dimensionless group by taking the first non-repeating variables and multiplying by the product of the repeating variables, each one to, the, to a certain power. The aim of the game is to find these powers. You, will, you have two no repeating variables, you will have two pi groups. You play this game two times. You have pi 1 and pi 2, please. And to, and to play the game, you, have, you just have to remember that each pi group is completely dimensionless. So dimension is nothing. So that means, so that means you, and you also know the law of powers of, of a to, um, let's say there are variables a, b, and c. A to the power of B multiplied by A to the power of C is equal to A to the power of B plus C. So we can easily use it to create addition and subtraction equations for, for each um, primary dimension. And then? You equate these to zero and solve them. That's what I'm going to do, actually. If possible, solve them. If possible, if you have two, if you have two equations that have the, Yeah. Guys, please, let me pr play this game in front of you. It's important for the exam and for the midterm test. Step number six, we will substitute into, we will replace the variables with their corresponding dimensions. So we have for pi one, mass length, time to the power minus 2, mass length power minus 3, A, length time to the power minus 1, B, length power C. This is for pi 1. For pi 2, mass length to the power minus 1, time minus 1, mass length to the power minus 3 alpha, length time minus 1 beta, length gamma. Now, step number 7. We solve 
these equations. How we do it? Let's focus on the first group, pi1. We have three variables, three dimensions, m, l, and t. m, m. We sum the corresponding exponents. Here m is to the power 1. Here is to the power alpha. A, sorry. Ah, sorry. Thank you. And we pose this sum equal to 0. From this, we obtain A equal to minus 1. Second dimensions, length. Here, 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 and here. And we can write the sum of the powers. 1 minus 3A plus B plus C equal to 0, which is 4 plus b plus c equal to 0. And then the third time, minus 2, minus 1, minus 2, minus b equal to 0. From this, we obtain a equal to minus 1, b equal to minus 2, C equal to minus 2. Now, we take this and we substitute to these powers here. So, we obtain pi1 equal to f divided by rho u power 2 h power 2. Are you convinced? Let me pose the question in another way. Who is not convinced? Guys, it's better if you ask me. May I help you? Where are you lost? This is a problem. This is a higher order problem. Okay. Where are we? Because in order to create the pi groups, the condition is that the sum of the exponents of the dimensions will be zero. OK? Please. So in this case, we chose three repeating variables. Change one of them with another one, say instead of rho, we took FB. Then we solve them. We we'll get a different values for. No, them. you will get the same result, but the calculations might be more difficult. Here you have just two pi groups, right? So and we are doing, let me finish, sorry. And we are doing it by hand, right? Imagine that you have 20 pi groups and you have to do it by hand. It's easier if you simplify your life. Do you agree on that? Yes. For a given problem, a given problem is governed by certain pi groups. Okay? We can play. Tell me. No, it's the way we define the pi groups. The pi groups are defined by definition by the repeating variables, the non-repeating variables, so which is unique, times a linear combination of the repeating ones. It's a definition. Second group. Pi 2, which was mu, rho power alpha, u power beta, h power gamma, which is mass length minus 1 time minus 1, mass length minus 3 alpha, length time minus 1 beta, length gamma. We play exactly the same game. 
So mass here and here. 1 minus alpha equal to 0. 1 plus alpha equal to 0. Alpha equal to minus 1. Length minus 1 minus 3 alpha data gamma. Minus 1 minus 3 alpha plus beta plus gamma equal to 0. Time this and this. Mm -hmm. Minus 1 minus beta equal to 0. From this, guys, please. We obtain alpha equal to minus 1, beta equal to minus 1, gamma equal to minus 1. This we substitute here and we obtain pi 2 equal to mu divided by rho u h. Please. So when we get a, so when we finally get a real answer, all we need to know is that the pi group that contains the variable that we want to find is a function of all other pi groups, right? At this point of the story, we are satisfied by having identified the pi groups. Now let me pose a question. At the beginning, we said that we have a wind coming against a certain wall, right? And we figured out that the problem admits two non-dimensionless groups. One, which is related to the force experienced by the wall, and pi 2. If you see, pi 2 is very close to the Reynolds number, okay? Now, apart from defining repeating and not repeating variables, we can also identify dependent and independent pi groups. How do we... Time out. How do we classify, how do we identify an independent and a dependent pi group? Let's have a look to this graph. I believe, please tell me. This is valid for all the pi groups. Mm -hmm. This is valid for all the pi groups. Right. Yeah. Now, please tell me. Uh, after we got the expression for pi groups, what do we do with both of them? The goal is to define the pi groups, okay? And to say, okay, this is my problem. It is governed by these pi groups. You can admit the presence of dependent and independent pi groups. The dependency depends on the problem you are tackling. Have you ever seen this graph in your life? Yes. This is the drag, the drag coefficient against a sphere as a function of the Reynolds number. How this graph is built? People have done some experiments, have put a sphere in the center of a channel, have changed the flow velocity, so have changed the Reynolds number, and have measured, as a consequence, the force experienced by the sphere. Am I correct or not? So, dependent and independent group. We have two groups, CD and Re. Drug coefficient and Reynolds number. According to what I just said, which is the dependent one? Please tell me. Dependent one? Reynolds number. No. The drug coefficient. The drug coefficient. Because the drug coefficient depends on the Reynolds number. Imagine that you are setting up an experiment. 
Okay, so you have a channel, you have your pipe flow, you have your channel full of water. You put a sphere in this channel, and then through certain tools, you are able to measure the force experienced by the sphere. You can change the flow by, for example, reducing the viscosity, changing the fluid. Or you can change the flow by pushing a stronger, a faster flow, right? As a consequence, you will measure a certain force acting on the body. Am I right or not? That's why the independent group is the Reynolds number. It's independent because you, the user, are able to change it. The drag force will change as a consequence of you changing the flow. That's why is the independent group. Are you convinced? If you are convinced, I can say that this lecture can finish now. If you, have to, if you want to pose me any question, I'm more than happy to reply. Otherwise, I will be more than happy to see you next week.
Google will see me like, like some like two. Yeah, I just, uh, yeah, we yeah, had a paid trade. Yeah, he just, I, yeah, I just tried uh, seven cards, even though so we have been some pieces of it. Yeah. Well, I thought, you know, because if they all have the same amount, and you have to work on it, they are higher than But they can't count on the number of players. Yeah. Toward the number of players. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. You can also have other plenty like this. And then you retrieve those ass barriers. Okay, that makes sense. Alright, thank you so much. One second, guys. Excuse me coming in and dashing it. I just wanted to make sure that I got yeah, charged. Yeah. That was all. I, I did the same. Uh, 